I'll just introduce myself. I'm Diana. I'm the Education Officer here at the Minster and working with many colleagues on the Leaves of Southwell project, which is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and um, is for conserving and reinterpreting our wonderful Leaves of Southwell, as well as providing a new roof for um, the choir of the Minster. Uh, this is the third of our series of online talks and it's Nicholas Pevsner, A Life in Exile and the Leaves of Southwell. Um, before we start, I did notice that a couple of people already have their hand up. Um, I don't know if, if Malcolm had something that he needed to say. Um, Malcolm, did you need to say something no. about... <clears throat> No, I didn't. Thank you. Okay. Michael Appleton also had his hand up. Is there some? It's just in case there's something we need to know before the, the presentation don't begins. Don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. Now, what's she making that funny face for? Diana. Yes. We can't hear you. You can't hear me. Got it. Uh, I don't know what to suggest about that. She doesn't know what. I You're very, very quiet. Something on your settings, because I don't think anybody else, mm. Anthony, has said they can't. They can't hear me. Can you hear me now? No. Just, but not properly. I think you might need to adjust the volume on your computer, but don't worry, Anthony, if it doesn't work, we'll circulate it to you afterwards. OK, so I'm going to introduce Helen. Dr Helen Bates is uh, the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Leaves of Southall project. Um, then, Kate, I think Boxy wants to turn, turn on. Somebody's not muted. She's the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Leaves of Southern Project, and she has a background in community heritage and ed heritage education. Helen joined us in December 2020, um, almost immediately COVID hit. But before it did, she managed to organise a Holocaust Memorial Day event at the Minster last January, when she spoke about Pevsner's family connection to the Holocaust. Pevner, Pevsner, of course, wrote the original Leaves of Southwell book, which was published in the 1940s and remains a bit of a Leaves of Southwell Bible for us. And she felt at the time that she hadn't had the time to do the story full justice. So she's very much been looking forward to bringing this talk to you today. Um, after Helen's talk and before questions, as it's Holocaust Memorial Day tomorrow, we're just going to take a moment of quiet reflection. We're going to take a full minute's quiet reflection before questions. So I'm going to pass over to Helen now and I very much hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you. Um, thank you, Diana. Um, I'm just waiting now for Aoife to load up the slides for this afternoon, which she's done that. Thank you very much for that, Aoife. And I will now take control of the PowerPoint. So welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, some of you may have attended that event that Diana's just mentioned last January, a year ago, actually a year ago uh, today, I think, um, where we marked Holocaust Memorial Day with um, an event in the Minster, in the choir, where we talked about the connections of Nicholas Pevsner and the Holocaust. And we also reflected on some of the other connections within our Minster community. Um, so in a sense, this talk revisits some of that. Last year, we had a lot of readings. We also had music, which was beautiful. Um, and it was a very emotional event. And I'm sure anyone who did join us that day will, will remember that. Um, so this gives me an opportunity really to spend some time um, going back to the story that I was telling that day um, about Nicholas Pevsner and his connections or his family's connections to the Holocaust. Um, and sort of fill in some of the gaps because that day it was it was a, a lunchtime event. You know, we kept, tried to keep it brief, really. And with the readings and the music, it only allowed, you know, a, a certain period of time to talk about that. So that's what I'm hoping to do this afternoon to sort of give you a little bit more of an insight into that. Um, so. 
I just want to mention before we, we sort of go on to the full talk, um, just for those who don't know the Minster, I'm sure there are many people here today who visited many, many times, but we may have some people who've joined us from around the country. I know in our last talk, we had people from, from different places across the UK, which is this is one of the benefits of doing these Teams talks. So if you haven't visited, you may not be aware that our project um, is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And this afternoon's talk is also funded by the National Lottery, Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, and we received um, two million pounds or so worth of funding um, from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, which was really connected to the conservation and repair work to the leaves of Southwell carvings in the late 13th century chapter house at the Minster. And as Diane has already mentioned, the leaves of Southwell book by Pevsner um, is it is in effect, you know, the sort of go to text that we look at. Um, the photographs and the comments that he made when that was published in 1945 um, by Penguin. Um, so what, what I really want to focus on here is to sort of think about how that's helped us, you know, not just, um, you know, sort of look at the conservation of the chapter house, but there's been lots of other benefits to the project as well. Um, obviously, the uh, the conservation work focuses very much on the physical built heritage of the leaves of Southwell carvings. And before um, COVID came along, we were all furloughed. I did quite a lot of work getting people organised to go on the roof tours and look at the chapter house in the Minster, um, which was, you know, a great way to sort of widen access to that site. And I think many of you here today, some of you may have been up on the roof and climbed the scaffolding. And that was quite um, quite, you know, sort of wonderful thing that we did. Um, but this uh, this other part of our community engagement work allows us to think about how we can widen participation in the project and, and different people we can connect to. And I think the story of Pevsner is one of those things because um, myself as a historian, I'm a local historian and a social historian. I'm not an architectural historian and I'm not particularly an art historian. Um, so when I came along to the project and was sort of looking into, um, you know, sort of some of the key key works around the leaves of Southwell, I read this book and I was really intrigued. Um, the thing that really struck me was when it was published in 1945. Um, you know, and as a local historian, a social historian, I was thinking, well, what was Pevsner doing there in 1945? Um, I mean, I'd come across Pevsner. He's sort of, as a local historian, you, you can't not come across Pevsner. Um, but I wanted to know a bit more about it. And it's sort of, I thought, you know, there's a story here um, to research and find out more about. Um, so he, at the time when the book was published, was then lecturer in the history of art at Birkbeck College at the University of London. And he did countless other things as well. Um, and it included in that book, 32 plates by Frederick Levi Attenborough, um, some of you will know is the father of um, Sir David and Lord Richard Attenborough, um, and that depicted the various calves leaves from the capitals of the columns of the Minster Chapter House. Uh, so it was interesting to me that here we had Pevsner and Attenborough, and this book was coming out in 1945, and I sort of really did wonder, you know, what was the story behind it? So I think this is kind of the basis of where this, this talk developed to find out a little bit more about it because it really intrigued me. And I'm sure some of you have perhaps in the past when you picked up that book and looked at it, have wondered also about the date. Um, so some of you here today may not be aware of Pevsner at all. Um, as a local historian, you know, if you look at any building at all, I remember from my time at university, people say, well, what does Pevsner say about the building? You know, so um, so you soon sort of go to things like the Buildings of England series and you start looking into, you know, what did Pevsner say? Um, now, that was first published in 1951. So we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of the publication of the Nottinghamshire edition of the Buildings of England, which is, is quite interesting in itself. Um, there was a later edition in 1979, and many of you will be aware that last year in 2020, um, the latest edition was published. Um, and there on the front cover, as you can see, we have our glorious uh, Minster Church um, featured as one of obviously the key buildings in Nottinghamshire. Um, so obviously Pevsner, you know, his legacy has lived on and it's a sort of go to for anybody interested in architectural history in Britain. And his small little book, The Leaves of Southwell, really did put 
the chapter house and the leaves of Southwell on the map. So it's sort of important to, to, to remember sort of the legacy of that book and, and, um, and what we owe him um, for, you know, sort of celebrating them in the way that he did and Attenborough's photographs. So I'm sure that made many people aware of them and then want to actually visit the chapter house and see them for themselves. Um, now, my talk today, as it was last January when I first delivered it, they're based on two key biographies that have been written on Pevsner's life. Um, now, the first one um, is by somebody called Stephen Gaines, Pevsner, The Early Life, Germany and Art. Um, there's a copy there. Um, now, that book by Stephen Games was published in 2010, and it was controversial. Um, if you were to Google it, you will see that there are all sorts of um, newspaper reviews at the time that took, um, if you like, offence in some cases at what Stephen Games was saying in his book, because what he's looking at is Pevsner's early life, his formative years in Germany, growing up in Germany and leaving Germany in 1933 to come to England. And um, Stephen Games looks at uh, all sorts of different things, but mainly about his education, um, Pevsner's time at university, his influences, and of course, the period that Pevsner is growing up in, as once we say about Germany in the 1930s, it doesn't take an awful lot to deduce that Pevsner is growing up at the time that the Nazis, or you know, in his formative years, Nazis were coming to power in Germany. Um, and Stephen Games, Stephen Games, it also makes the point that. Um, hang on a minute, I've got um, I've got people saying they can only see the intro slide. Is that the case for other people as well? No. I've just keep seeing little. I can see a slide with two books on it, Helen, and the titles. That's um, okay. That you're I've just got, going through. I've got an awful lot of comments pinging up saying I can't see the slide. I can't see the slide, so I really don't know what what's happened there with the technology for some people. Um, but you can move the slides on by swiping left and right. So there's arrows at the bottom of the page. Right. Okay. Um. It should be automatically moving on, though. So, you know, I'm I'm moving the slides. And if you can see the two at the moment, the Pebs and the biographies on, then you are on the right slide. So hopefully, hopefully everyone's on the right on the same page. OK, right. So so carry on. So um, so that's OK. I think everyone's OK with the slides. Right. So the Pevsner biographies are are interesting because, like I say, 2010, this one came out, which was controversial. There was criticisms that Games had taken small lines from documents that Pevsner had written and expanded a whole story on it. Um, yeah, I think, can we just stop sending the comments on the slides? I keep getting lo lots coming through now saying that the slides are fine. Um, so the following year, Susie Harries's book, Nicholas Pevsner's The Life, um, was published, where she sort of take, took um, a slightly different view and a slightly more rounded view on that um, and actually you can sort of see here this sort of you know <laughs> the, how big that book is um, and the sort of attention to detail she gave and Stephen Games book but they're both really worth reading and the point of this is not for me to judge you know um, the point is to go away perhaps and, and get these books for yourself they're available on secondhand book sellers really quite affordably so um, so you know that's something to think about but Susie, so the information from this talk is specifically drawn from those two books, um, sort of comparing some of the things they say in each of the books. But, um, but Stephen Games did did face a lot of criticism at the time from the art historian, you know, in the art history world, um, because obviously Pevsner is an institution. Um, so moving on from that. Um, a little bit about Pevsner's early life and why we would be marking it um, today on the eve of Holocaust Memorial Day. You know, what are the connections of you know, Pevsner's life with that? Um, he was born in Leipzig in Germany um, in an area um, called Waldstraßviertel. I hope I'm right. We've got a German member of the audience with us today checking on my pronunciations and a lot none. Um, 
so that area was a predominantly Jewish area um, and it wasn't perhaps the you know the sort of the most affluent area but his parents soon moved on from there um, they were both Russian by birth and they were fur traders and Leipzig in the late 19th and early 20th century was a center for, for fur trading um, and a lot of Jewish people moved from Eastern Europe, Russia, and came to um, settle in Leipzig and carry on the trade, you know, with the family members that remained back um, in the, um, those areas. Um, so both his parents were Jewish um, and he was of Russian birth. Now, his parents who had come to Leipzig um, right at the end of the 19th century, his father, Hugo Pevsner, had tried um, on a couple of occasions to obtain uh, citizenship, um, but he hadn't been successful. Um, and it was right up until after the um, First World War broke out that he was accepted um, and became a citizen of Saxony, where, where Leipzig is. Now, this meant, I mean, Stephen Gaines makes the point of this, which I think is quite interesting, that up to about the age of 12, Hevsner was a Russian child from a Russian family, a Russian Jewish family and not German. And I think what we have to understand at this time is that in Germany, in Germany, there was um, obviously um, anti-Russian sentiment. It was the time as we moved towards the build up to the First World War of heightened nationalism as it was across across Europe at the time. But Germany was, you know, sort of expanding, um, you know, its, its ideas of empire. Um, and the Russians were treated with distrust. And Stephen Games makes the point that, you know, Pevsner grew up in a school, in a German school, um, as a Russian citizen, and almost like being treated as a second class citizen, potentially. And he was Jewish um, because, you know, obviously anti-Semitism was not something that came along with, with the, the Nazi party. It was there, um, you know, across Europe um, and building up in, you know, in the years previous to that, as we, something we all know. Um, so that's interesting information about Pevsner and his early childhood um, and this feeling may be that he, though he was from Germany, um, he had, you know, scattered roots um, and perhaps, you know, when he made the decision to come to England, it wasn't, you know, a, a heartbreaking choice. Um, Pevsner's early life, whoops, one minute. Um, he was educated at St Thomas's School in Leipzig. Um, from September 1912. Now, this is a, a picture of a postcard I found on eBay, actually, um, which is beautiful because it actually shows the school um, in, I think it's, I think Hanalon might tell me that's Jubilee year, 1912. So right on at the time that Pevsner started there, he was, um, Susie Harris described him as diligent and gifted, but Pevsner was very sort of critical about his own abilities. Um, though he was from a Jewish background, he did have Hebrew lessons, but he didn't um, didn't want to learn Hebrew at school. He was sort of quite um, resistant to embracing his Jewish culture. Now, I think an interesting point about St. Thomas's Church is it was a choral school and every Friday, St. Thomas's um, school, it was choral school for St. Thomas's Church in Leipzig. And every Friday afternoon, the choir gave a free concert, though Pevson was not in the choir. But that's quite similar to our own, to the Minster Church. Um, now, more important perhaps to Pevsner than his Jewish culture and his Russian culture was the Salon culture, um, which is really something that was propagated by his mother, Annie Pevsner, who I have told you is from a Jewish background. But Annie was totally assimilated um, into German culture. In her residence in Leipzig, um, as the uh, Pevsners went up the social scale, as they gained in prosperity through their fur trading business, Annie hosted um, all sorts of artists, poets, politicians of the time. She had a sort of open salon where people came and went. Um, so there, it was a sort of, I suppose, a hotbed of intellectualism, something that somebody like Pevsner would absolutely have um, prospered in, you know, and thrived in, in receiving all these, this, this additional education, if you like. And the Pevsners were, well, Annie was cultured, you know, she was interested in music, in art, in architecture, um, in women's rights. 
And so she would have been obviously a huge influence in Patterson's life and his decision to go on to become an art historian at university. Um, so his Jewish roots then, as I mentioned earlier, when he was born in Waldstrasse Viertel in Leipzig, it was classed as Susie Harris tells us, it's one of Leipzig's most strongly Jewish districts until 1939 and the war came. Um, he described his own father as actively Jewish, but his mother was assimilated. He rejected his bar mitzvah. There's some controversy about that. Stephen Games tells us it's because his father was away during the First World War. He was in Stockholm, fur trading. Um, Susie Harris doesn't really come to conclusions about it, but he didn't have a bar mitzvah. So for a Jewish boy, um, you know, that's quite significant that he didn't do that and shows that perhaps but there with the influence of his mother, who totally rejected her Jewish culture and faith. Um, that's perhaps why that happened. When he went to university, he converted to Lutheranism. So that's the key point. But that's not unusual because at that stage, universities, in order to get on at university, to get a teaching post, something like that, um, you know, Jewish people, um, even in the early 1920s, would have found that quite difficult. Now, Pepsner at university. Now, he asked, he was at the sixth form, let's call it the sixth form equivalent, a bit like our Minster sixth form, of um, the St. Thomas School. What they did at Germany at the time, which I think is a great idea, is they allowed you to have taster sessions. Um, just as you were coming up to university age, you could go to the local university and have taster sessions of something that you're interested in. So you could sort of book yourself onto a module almost. And that's what, that's what um, Pevsner did. He went to Leipzig University in his final year at school and he chose art history. Um, and the students were encouraged to what they called audit a course. So go along and sort of have a sort of a trial and see how they got on. And he, his course that he chose was some a course lectured by Wilhelm Pinder. Pinder was a specialist in German medieval sculpture. So there's your big influence coming in for the leaves of Southwell. This, this man Pinder became um, a bit of an idol to Pevsner as, as a young, youngish boy, as a youth. Um, he was so fascinated by Pinder that when he went on to university in Munich, he sent his mother along to take notes on Pinder's lectures so that he could, you know, he could have them. This was before online teaching and Zooms and Teams and what have you. So I think that's quite interesting to thought of his mother sitting in the lecture theatres take, taking notes on art history. Um, now, the key thing about P Pinder that um, Stephen Games talks about is that he classes Pinder as somebody who was sympathetic to the Nazi cause. Uh, and one of the roles that Pinder went on to do under the Nazis was to be um, a, an expert on looted art, um, advising the Nazis on that. So, um, so that's kind of sort of tainted his reputation. Um, although, you know, Susie Harries talks about how later on Pinder um, almost renounced the Nazis and changed his views. Um, now, Pevsner then moved on to Berlin to study after Munich. Um, and one of the things he studied there was religious architecture of the West. So again, you know, you can see how he became so interested in looking at, uh, you know, our medieval chapter house um, at Southwell. And he finally gained his PhD on, but on Baroque architecture in 1924. Now, just a little bit about anti-Semitism um, and the international culture of anti-Semitism and how that started to affect Pevsner, because Pevsner was one of these people, when you read the biography, anybody who's ever had any sort of academic career knows that there are certain people who absolutely, you know, make that the be all and end all of their life. And it's feel, they feel that they are you know, born to teach and born to lecture and, and born to pass on knowledge to students and you get this really strong impression that that's what Pevsner, that was Pevsner's um, interest. Um, but he was a young man at a time when it was going to be difficult for him to take on that career at universities in Germany. Now, um, Pevsner um, didn't regard himself as Jewish. You know, he'd converted to Lutheranism. Um, he never had a bar mitzvah. He had no interest in his Jewish culture and that's very apparent in his later writings. But that didn't matter because, you know, by race, he was regarded as a Jew. Um, 
by the Nazis, but but the point is that this this kind of anti-Semitism was building up, um, you know, around the world, not just in Germany. Um, so this I think is interesting. Here we have um, the International Jew, which was published in Leipzig in 1929, um, about the time when Persner did get his first uh, proper job at the university, um, and you know this was actually published in America by Henry Ford's publishing company yeah Henry Ford and um, automobiles um, which you know I won't go into details it's something that you might want to go and look at this is um, this image I think is from the um, American Holocaust Memorial Center but some um, German universities at that time actively discriminated against employing practicing Jews so many would be lecturers converted to Christianity and that's the root cause of why Pevsner converted to Lutheranism um, and at the same time, recession in Germany, those of you who know German history in the 1920s, you know, before the Nazis came to power, will know about the terrible impact of the recession. So, you know, jobs were at a premium anyway. And a bit about Leipzig as well. I mean, obviously, Pevsner moved on to other places to teach, but Leipzig itself had one of the largest Jewish, Jewish populations in Saxony. In 1925, it had 13,000 Jews living there, and most of those were of East European descent. After the Nazis took power in 1941, most of those Jewish people had either left the, the town or they had been sent on to various um, concentration camps, labour camps, but 2,500 of them left in um, left in Leipzig were crowded into 43 Judenhausen, not specifically a ghetto, but houses that were specifically designated um, for Jews. And in 1991, only 35 Jewish inhabitants remained in Leipzig. Um, and this image here um, from the Yad Vashem photo archive is uh, on Kristallnacht, when the synagogue, one of the main synagogues in Leipzig was, was firebombed. Um, by the Nazis, so um, giving you an, an idea of, you know, like how difficult it was for those Jewish people who remained um, in Leipzig. So when um, Pevsner got his job as a lecturer in 1929 at the University of Gersing, and that was his first sort of proper paid job as a lecturer, um, it was a difficult time, you know, um, the Nazis, um, their popularity was certainly on the rise. Um, lots of students, you know, supported them, let alone other staff members. There were anti-Semitism, um, you know, rife across the universities and riots against Jewish people that were organised by students. Um, now, he had married um, his childhood sweetheart, uh, Lola, in 1923 they went on honeymoon in Bavaria I was reading the notes on this and I thought it was really interesting that at the time a person took along all his work and his research and his suitcase you know and sort of carried on doing his research their first daughter was named after Uta in Naumburg Cathedral now if anyone saw Chris um, Chris Brooks's talk last week he talked about the paint sampling in the chapter house and I think he used this image um, of Uta um, and Naumburg is very renowned for its carved leaves, its medieval leaf carvings as well. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, connections between or supposed connections between the Minster and, and Naumburg. Um, and it was one of um, Pevsner and um, Nicholas and Lola Pevsner's favourite places to visit. Um, so he um, secured this job as a lecturer in 1929, University of Göttingen, married with children. But he was forced to resign in 1933 um, once the Nazis had taken power. Um, and that's because they had introduced um, laws which banned those of Jewish birth from holding civic and civil posts such as university lecturers. Um, now, after he came to England, he was forced out of his post. He searched for an academic post outside Germany. Um, and, you know, that's quite a long story of the sort of heartbreak, really, he went through trying to carry on his career, um, turning up for interviews. There's an account that Susie Harris gives when he went to the University of Edinburgh um, and he was basically thought he'd been successful. But at the end of the, end of the day, 
um, it was because he was a foreigner that he didn't get the job. Now, Pevster um, later on um, wrote a family history. And he, in that family history, which he wrote on for his children in 1954, he wrote in it, you are, to put it in the Nazi way, 75% Jewish. Jewish completely on my side and on your mother's side, a mother's mother's side. So um, Lola, uh, Pevsner's wife, was half Jewish. Her mother was Jewish. So this made their children 75% Jewish. Um, he didn't tell his children that until they were much older. He did not tell his three children that they had Jewish ancestry, Jewish blood, Jewish heritage. That was something that he kept from them. Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, why is she telling us this? You know, what is the relevance of this? Well, to the Nazis, it was extremely, extremely relevant. And the um, Nuremberg race laws that were enacted in 1935 um, were the Nazis' way of defining who was Jewish. And by definition, as we all know, that being defined as Jewish was a death sentence. Um, eventually for many, many people that were li living not in, well in Germany and in the surrounding countries. And what it basically said was that if you had, if you were, as using Pevsner's word, 75% Jewish, then you were defined as a Jew. Um, and then there were other varying sort of elements. And these two, um, two diagrams are from that, and they come from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, um, but they come from those race laws. Now, Pevsner went to London, went to England in 1933, but it took to March 1936 for his wife and children to join him. That's quite a long time and things were getting really tough in Germany by that point. Um, so, you know, Lola was not keen on leaving. She she was settled in Germany. Would you want to leave a country that you'd grown up in, that your family were all there, that you were you know safe and secure in your house? But finally, things began to look so drastic that they did come and they did join him. Um, now, one of the um, Susie Harries puts across a really strong point when when Stephen Gaines potentially um, says that Pevsner has sympathies with the Nazis. Um, through some of his writings, through his influence by Pinder and things like that. Um, Susie Harris puts across the point really strongly that actually, um, would you be perhaps that sympathetic with the Nazis or fully believe in the Nazis' cause if you knew your children were classed as Jewish and in August 1939, you decided to send your children back from England on a family holiday in Germany. I mean, it is absolutely um, for that to happen, for Pevsner and his wife to make that choice. It shows absolute naivety, if nothing else. Um, they sent their three children in August 1939 back to Germany, even though they knew they were classed in the eyes of German law at the time as 75 percent Jewish and they're Jewish, you know, and they knew that um, what you know, was, was already being said by the Nazis um, about the Jews. So this is a very strange, strange thing. Um, and, um, you know, difficult to sort of get our heads around it. Now, what happened was that when war broke out, the children, the three children were still in Germany. Now, his two younger children, um, they were able to get back to England. Um, they had the right papers. They were classed as children. They came back on a boat. Um, not an easy journey, but they came back. But his eldest daughter, Uta, was stuck in Germany. She was nearly 16 and she did not have the right paperwork. So she was a Jewish girl stuck in Germany, staying with a cousin of her mother's. Um, and so she and she lived out the rest of the war in Germany. Now, how would you feel if you thought your daughter was, you know, put yourself in Pevson's shoes and his wife, that your daughter was now in Germany, um, you know, and, and classed in their eyes as, as, you know, fully Jewish and... Um, and obviously at, at huge risk. And that and that's what happened. So I think Susie Harris puts across the point that Pevsner was incredibly naive and had, did not appreciate the full threat that, you know, um, 
that the Nazi party, that Hitler's Germany would, would pose to Jewish people. And, you know, perhaps they weren't alone. And obviously out in Germany at the time was also, um, let me just go back to that side, um, out in Germany also was, was Pevsner's other family, including his, his mother, uh, his father, um, you know, and now his, his eldest daughter. So what I want to just do now is um, I'm going to go back to part of the text that I, I read out at the memorial service um, last year, just to sort of bring this um, to a conclusion in terms of what his, his family went through. Um, so we've already covered the fact that he came to England in 1933 and his wife and children didn't join him until March 36. But they did leave behind their wider family, including Pevsner's parents, Annie and Hugo. Um, Pevsner was worried about his parents against the rising tide of persecution, but he left it too late to arrange their passage as refugees to England. Um, but they also initially resisted the suggestion to leave. Pevsner's mother, Annie, had feared abandoning everything they had in Germany. Um, and told a friend that she did not want to become a financial burden on the children. So she also was just as Lola had resisted and didn't come until 36. Pevsner's parents also resisted. Now Pevsner's parents ended up having to leave their apartment and move into a much poorer area of town because their apartment was requisitioned for use by Germans. Um, so they ended up in um, in a, quite an impoverished state from being, you know, a, a wealthy, um, successful family. And Pevsner's father died in January 1940. Um, shortly before his death, Annie found him in the middle of the night, fully dressed, telling her, quote, they must leave at once or else they would be fetched. So that gives you an indication of the state of his mind at the time of his death. And these, this information was passed on to the Pevsners by a friend of theirs living in Germany who was, um, you know, was not Jewish and was able to you know, keep in touch with the family. Um, after her husband died, then Annie was on her own and she was forced to move into the Judenwohnungen. Those are the, the Jewish houses I told you about, um, which were specifically assigned to the Jewish population. Um, on the 1st of September 1941, it was compulsory for all Jews in Germany to wear a yellow star and Annie was no exception and she was also forced to take the name Sarah, a Jewish name. To one official she said, you know that this is a fraud, my name is not Sarah. She was now determined to leave Germany, so we're now talking about the autumn of 1941. Um, she bought a ticket on a boat which was leaving for Cuba and would sail on the 15th of November. But time had run out and soon there was no way of her leaving. By October 1941, the Nazis started a complete deportation of Jews from Germany to ghettos and countries that they had occupied like Poland. So they literally, um, you know, Annie had left it far too late. In January 1942, plans for the final solution were launched with a whole-scale murder of all Jews throughout Germany and the German-occupied territories. One by one, the Jewish population of Leipzig was deported and Annie now awaited her turn. A Gentile friend of Annie's, Liz Nauf, who I mentioned earlier, later told Pevsner that her, one day his mother had received a warning of her imminent deportation, which was sent by an anonymous source. The time has come. From his home in London with Lola, when, where they had endured the blitz, Pevsner had now lost all communication with 65-year-old Annie. And on the morning of the 11th of January, sorry, the 11th of February, 1942, the British newspapers had reported the bombing of Bremen. Whilst in Leipzig, the prospect of deportation and all that she would endure was too much for Annie and she took her own life on the night of the 10th of February. So she committed suicide. And when he heard of her death some months later, Pevsner wrote to his friend Liz that he knew little, quote, of all those worries and the horrors which she must have gone through and how often she must have been in despair. I reproach myself bitterly for so many things. I mean, what a state of mind he must have been in to have heard that news and have found out how 
his mother had died in those circumstances, in absolute desperate circumstances, a 65 year old woman. Um, so. I wonder, um, you know, for me, looking at the Leaves of Southwell and thinking about when that was published, you know, I wonder what sort of state of, of mind um, Pevsner would have been in, you know, following that that information about his mother and knowing that his eldest daughter was still in Germany as well. Um, now, when war broke out in England, I mean, it wasn't, you know, easy for Pevsner in the sense that initially, you know, he was looked on as an as an alien, um, an enemy alien. So again, you know, you remember this time when he was a child growing up in Russia, in, in Germany in class as a Russian, he's now in England, he's classed as a foreigner, he's classed as an alien. And he was um, eventually um, interned um, in a camp near Liverpool. But it also brought um, work opportunities as well, because with all the lecturers at universities, um, you know, conscripted into the forces, um, Pevsner actually managed to find a bit more work lecturing. And that's why one of the reasons why I ended up at Birkbeck. So there were some positive things that came out of it for him. Um, just to, to finish off with Annie Pevsner and his, you know the story of his mother, on the Yad Vashem um, website, which um, there is the you know the link is up there if you ever want to look at this, they have the central database of the Shoah victims' names. Now this is a database of all known victims of the Holocaust, and it keeps expanding and adding to. There are millions and millions of people in there, and um, and that Yad Vashem comes from Isaiah 56, um, 5. And to them will I give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name, Yad Vashem, that shall not be cut off. And the purpose of this database is to remember those names of the Jewish people that we lost in the Holocaust and have otherwise been forgotten. Now, Annie Pevsner's name is on this database, Pevsner's mother. And it tells us her, there is a name, Anna, her maiden name, Perlman, that was her maiden name, um, her date of birth, 1876, her place of birth in Moscow. And she died on the 11th of February, 1942, cause of death, suicide in Leipzig. Um, and what the database does is there is, I can't show you on here, but it pops up and it explains why so many Jewish people committed suicide. It was, it was, you know, something that perhaps we don't think about a great deal, um, but it classes that as a death, obviously caused by um, the conditions at, um, and the Holocaust. Now, there are other Perlman deaths as well on the database, and I think the Perlmans of Leipzig, some of the women that appear on there, um, are Annie Pevsner's sister-in-laws. There is an Ida and there is also a, um, a Clara, um, both um, Pevsner women uh, by surname, born around the same time, um, uh, could possibly be her sisters. Both of these women, again, in their 60s, were um, transported to Theresienstadt, where both of them died there in, in Theresienstadt. So um, again, there are more connections of the Pevsner family, which, um, and I'm sure there are more things to understand and learn. Um, now, just as we, we finish off on, on talking about Pevsner, um, the Leaves of Southwell, although it wasn't published until 1945, it was particularly interesting to me that the manuscript was accepted in 1942. So when I said to you, how was Pevsner feeling when he was standing in that, that in the chapter house? In the book, he talks about the spiritual experience in the chapter house, looking at a building that had stood there for centuries and, and feeling that he, I think, felt the sense of God there, felt a sense of spirituality. Um, and this thinking about when his mother died in, in, in early 41 and the, the manuscript completed in 42, this was a time when his mind would, would have been, I'm sure, in great turmoil. So it does, you know, really bring it home, that connection. Um, over to you, in a sense, later on, because, you know, it, we, we, we know very little, I think, about um, the circumstances of that manuscript, um, but people on this, this meeting may know more that they can share with us, and it would certainly be, 
be useful to know that. Um, just finishing off another um, connection to the Holocaust with the book The Leaves of Southwell was Frederick Levi Attenborough's contribution through his photographs. And as I mentioned at my talk last year, Attenborough, father of Sir David, Lord Richard and John Attenborough, was born in Stapleford, Nottinghamshire in 1887, and he went on to be principal of Leicester University College. Now, the Attenboroughs used their home in Leicester, which is actually on the campus of the University of Leicester I went to, uh, which is now the maths department. They used it as a staging post for Jewish refugee children who were coming from Nazi Germany and were traveling on to the United States. And um, the grandson of Frederick Attenborough talks about that and shares more of that story. Um, now, when war broke out, two of these children were with the Attenboroughs waiting for them to to make contact and get in touch with their relatives in America so they could send them over. Um, they were, you know, war broke out, which meant it would be difficult for them to travel to America. And the two girls, Helga and Irene Bejak, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, they were there and they then stayed with the Attenboroughs for the duration of the war. So these were, if you like, kinder transport children who then stayed with the Attenboroughs. Um, and Michael um, Attenborough, the grandson of Frederick, says that they were formally adopted because um, the parents had completely disappeared. They later found out their father had been murdered in Auschwitz. Um, now, I think one of the nice um, parts of this story, if you like, if it has a nice part of it, is that one of the girls bought from her homeland, um, she bought a piece of amber, which she gave to David Attenborough. And this is one of the things apparently that he talks about kind of sparked his interest, you know, in, in nature and the planet, this, this piece of amber that had come, literally come on the kinder transport. So it's um, it's another connection um, uh, to the project. And, and obviously, um, Frederick Attenborough is a, a Nottinghamshire man as well, so it's a local connection. So to end um, our talk then this afternoon, um, I would like us to think about Holocaust Memorial Day, some of the things we've talked about this afternoon. Um, we're on the eve um, of Holocaust Memorial Day, that will be tomorrow. There are plenty of events going on. At the end of this, I will put a slide up with a link to their website, which will give you all sorts of ideas for um, things that you can, you can look on there. There's all sorts of online things happening tomorrow. There are services in some of the, um, the churches around the country. There are films playing. So please have a look and, and maybe tomorrow, if you've got some spare time, you, you know, you can perhaps participate in some of those events. Um, but what I would like to do is I would like to um, ask us all, um, I think we're all muted. Um, I'm going to mute myself as well. And I'd like to ask us all to keep a minute's silence in memory of all those who died in the Holocaust. Um, and we will keep the minute's silence from now. Thank you. And thank you for listening to our presentation this afternoon. Um, we'll take questions um, soon. There's some links there if you'd like to find out more about um, the Leaves of Southwell project. If there's anything you'd like to contribute. Um, also, as I said, the Holocaust Memorial Day. Um, have a look there at events that are happening tomorrow. If you've got any questions um, that you'd like to ask that you don't want to perhaps ask on this, this um, Teams talk, then there's my email address. And I'd be very you know, happy for you to, to email me.
um, or if you've got anything to contribute about the Pevsner story connected to the chapter house that we perhaps don't know about, we would absolutely love to hear from you. So thank you everybody for listening and um, and, uh, and hopefully the questions will be um, contributions as well and, and ideas and suggestions perhaps for, for other events that we could do linked to Pevsner and the chapter house. Thank you, Helen. That was a really interesting insight into somebody we perhaps feel we know quite well from his book, The Leaves of Southwell, but that was fascinating. Thank you. As Helen said, if you um, would like to contribute with comments or questions, either use the hands up icon at the top of your screen, the little hand, um, or use the chat. Um, there's one question here on the chat which says uh, from Peter, Pevsner's occupation on his internment document is shown as mercantile advisor. Why is this as both why is this as both pre and post immigration? This was in Chipping Camden and it's unlikely he travelled from there to Southwell, especially during wartime. How was his knowledge and interest in Southwell stimulated from the North Cotswolds? Oh, okay. So at that, when Pevsner, I think I mentioned earlier, when Pevsner came over to to England, I mean he was an academic through and through. He he, you know that was his 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 love. You know he just wanted to do his research and you know share the love for his art history research. But he found it increasingly just absolutely difficult to to get a job. So what he ended up doing was working for a company. Um, which was advising on design. Now, I'm really sorry, but I've forgotten the name of them, but they were based in the Cotswolds um, and perhaps somebody can Google away and, and find out the name of the company. So he was actually using his, um, it's quite interesting really, he was using his academic knowledge, um, but sort of refining that into commercial, you know, ideas and the company were, um, yeah, they were designing various sort of household things. This is this is my memory ticking over. But no, it's a really good question because you sort of think, well, you know, but all through it's like any academic, um, you know, academics are sort of job jobbing people unless they're lucky enough to get um, full time posts, which is increasingly difficult nowadays. So, you know, so what Pevson was doing, he was going around giving talks and doing odd bits of lecturing and he was writing bits for journals and and for popular magazines, newspapers, Gordon Russell and Company and Broadway. Thank you, whoever sent that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he was literally um, sort of a multitasking kind of freelancing um, until come the war, you know, and suddenly there were more vacancies available because a lot of the, you know, younger lecturers and what have you, or even the older ones had gone off to do important war work, you know. Um, so that that's sort of gave him a bit of stability, strangely enough. But yeah, no, it's an interesting one. He really was. Um, I mean, if you read that biography by Susie Harris, it, it, the energy of the man, you know, you're just literally like blown away by his energy and everything he did. He was he was really dedicated because I think he absolutely loved, you know, design, um, architecture and, of course, art history. There was a question in there about the Southwell connection as well, wasn't there? Was there? I didn't see that. Something to do with how did he end up going from the Cotswolds up to? Oh, that's right. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, same. It was on the same comment. How was his knowledge and interest in Southwell stimulated from the North Cotswolds? Well, that's an interesting one as well. And anyone who who um, attended the Pevsner book, the launch, the the latest edition of that last summer, I think it was. Um, that was one of the questions that came up then, basically saying, why did he, um, this was on the buildings of England in um, 51, but they were sort of saying, why did he focus on Nottinghamshire so much? Um, and I mean, I don't think that was ever answered. And that was the experts who were involved in, you know, in, in um, writing the latest edition of that. But I think there was perhaps, um, you know, perhaps the varied buildings in, in Nottinghamshire, but it could be the Naumburg connection as well, you know, the leaves of the, the leaf carvings in that um, cathedral and, and perhaps being drawn over to Southwell to do that comparison. But that's just me speculating. Thank you. Um, the, well, there were no hands up as yet. So nobody wanting to make a comment or ask a question. Oh, here's a. Oh. 
um, sorry, I'm having to flick from the list of participants to the chat. And now I've got a wheel going around. Just a moment. I can, I can see something that's saying, can you say a bit more about the games biography being? That's it. Does it say controversial or? Uh, could you say a bit more about why the games biography was controversial? You mentioned the allegations about Nazism later, but was the book as a whole not well received? Um, so if, or I suppose I became aware of the games biography because I read the Harry's book first and I couldn't get my hands on the games book. Um, and I just read newspaper um, reviews at the time, which were available online, which were basically shooting games down in flames because he was basically saying that Pevsner had Nazi sympathies, which was based on some of his writing at the time. Um, but I think the, the Pinder who I, I mentioned, um, who had connections to the Nazi party, um, you know, I think this was games, you know, people were a bit concerned that games had sort of taken very, he hadn't seen, he hadn't, the family, Pevsner's family did not give him access to Heaven's Diary. I've got some feedback going on there. Can you hear that? Um, anyway, I'm trying try to speak over that. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the controversial, you know, it was controversial because Games was making these allegations and Pevsner is one of the, um, right, and Pevsner was was one of the people in, in, I don't know, British culture that we sort of kind of have a great sort of admiration affinity with. So it was a bit of a shock for people, for somebody to, to come out and say this. And Susie Harry's biography, in a sense, defends some of that. I mean, there is a line that she quotes where Pevsner in his, in his diaries that she saw actually says something about the left. Left is the way, you know, in terms of politics, but then he, instantly discounts what had happened in Russia, you know, in terms of um, communism. So I think um, that's why it was controversial, because it was just speculating, was Pevsner a Nazi sympathiser? You know, and I think um, you have to go away, my disclaimer, and read both biographies. I'm not on commission for selling these books to sort of make up your own um, mind, but or go online and read some of the newspaper uh, some of the reviews, the book reviews, because um, they're quite interesting. But I think it's it's like anyone as a young person, you know, you're you're obviously you're influenced by who's teaching you, family members, who's around. But I think Susie Harry's conclusion was that Pevsner was in no way, shape or form a political activist or really that interested in politics. He was interested in um, he was interested in art history and architecture, you know, <laughs> and that's what took took his um, his time up, you know, sort of focusing on that. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of, I think, uh, hopefully that's an answer. Okay, thank you. We've got a couple of hands up. So um, I think if we start with John Isherwood, um, can you unmute yourself, John? Do we need to do it? Just wondering if Eva knows. Can we unmute John? I don't think so. I think John has to do it himself. Okay. John Isherwood, can you unmute yourself? Okay. While, oh. we're, while we're waiting for John, I can just say someone, I've just seen what happened yeah. to Uta. She did. Oh, he's here, he is. Can you right. hear me? I'm sorry about that. First of all, greetings to John Beckett, who I can see in front of me. Hope you're OK, John. My question is this. Can you please tell us some more about how Nicholas Pevsner came to work for Lane at Penguins? He was followed uh, by his son, Dieter, afterwards. Can you tell us anything about what happened to Dieter Penguin, uh, Penguin Pevsner and his family, please? Um, what later on in terms of Dieter? Yes. I mean, first of all, how did was the it was crucial for Pevsner's career. How did the uh, link with Penguin Books come about? Because it, he was their main publisher uh, of, of all his work. But his son, Dieter, also followed Nicholas Pevsner into 
into Penguin Books and worked for them? Um, I've got to tell you, John, that I don't know straight answer because I kind of focus very much on, you know, the sort of um, the area of Pevson's life sort of prior um, to that. So it's something that I haven't, I, you know, it, again, it's, I think she covers it in the biography, but it's something that I don't know the immediate answer to. Um, certainly I can have a look for you and, and see, see what she says and, and email it to you if, that, if that's of any help. Thank you. Yes, that would be very helpful. Yeah. Okay, thanks, John. And uh, Jennifer Cray has her hand up. Can you unmute yourself, Jennifer? There we go. Is that better? That's better. Um, Thank you. Uh, it's in the new book of Pesner. It's not exact copy because Penguin had produced this new book, haven't they, on Pesner, which came out last year. And it also has a picture of um, our medieval tower in it. Um, I, I live at Hal Orton, yes, Pavel. Yeah. Did you? No, the building yeah. of England, Nottinghamshire, 2020. Is that what? Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and that uh, was done by the local photographer who lives in Nottingham. Yeah. Um, so that, no, very interesting. Thank you very much indeed. I've learned a lot. Oh, thank, thank you, Jennifer. Um, there's a nice comment here from John Anderson who says he's here because he heard Pevsner's off Tripos or Tripos public lectures when he was a student in Cambridge in 1960. I was entranced by his enthusiastic knowledge of early medieval sculpture about which I knew nothing. And actually, I think even today, that little book, The Leaves of Southwell, is actually a really good read, isn't it? Even though it was written so long ago. Um, someone else says the bookshop Five Leaves in Nottingham hosted a talk with Claire Hartwell, who has updated the latest Nottinghamshire edition. She theorises on why Knots was the second book in the Buildings of England series and her talks on YouTube in the Five Leaves account. Yeah. And somebody else wants to know, uh, PJ Wilkinson wants to know what happened to Pevsner's daughter, Uta, who you said survived the war. Yeah, she, again, um, in again mainly in Susie Harry's um, book, she survives and she returns but there's not a great deal of information given about her. She she doesn't seem to spend the war sort of really hiding out, you know, in the sense that, you know, we, we hear about people like, you know, um, Anne Frank and people like that. Um, but she sort of, remember, she doesn't know she's Jewish. You know, that that's, the person has chose not to tell her, their children that. Um, so whether that, um, she, you know, she didn't feel Jewish. She didn't have any Jewish identity. She was totally unaware. Um, but it's very, you know, it's almost like it would be good to find out more information about that because she didn't. The one of the reasons why she didn't come back to Britain is she didn't have the right paperwork in place. So how she then managed to um, survive the war without those questions being asked, I'm not sure at all. So, um, but yeah, so that's another there's a lot of things when I read the books that I was like I'd like to know some more information about that and that's why I said it's interesting about the comment about the Cambridge lectures you know it'd be interesting if people have got information to share particularly about what John was saying about you know the connection to Penguin books um, because that would be really useful for us to know about and I, and I have wondered why why was he in, in Southwell what you know what took him here um, I don't know. So, yeah, anybody who does have information on that, that would be really useful for us to know for the project. OK, well, thank you, Helen. I think it's time um, probably that we wrapped up. Um, I'm sure you'd all want to join with me in saying a huge thank you to Helen for all her research and time she put into this talk today. I tried doing rounds of applause on Zoom, but they on uh, Teams, sorry, but they don't always work brilliantly, but um, we can give it a try. And we've got our next talk on the 9th of February, and this time we're going to be joined by Philip Dixon, Professor Philip Dixon, who is our cathedral archaeologist, and he's also one of our consultants for the Leaves of Southwell project. So he'll be exploring the archaeology of Southwell Minster and discuss the means by which our ancient ancestors created 
one of a, the great buildings of the 13th century. And you can find out about that and book from the events page on the South Minster website. Um, as soon as we finish, Aoife will be sending around an evaluation form. It's incredibly helpful to us if you fill that in. It shouldn't take more than about five minutes unless you want to write us an essay. Um, and we do read them all carefully and they help us to inform future sessions like these, which are still quite new to us, of course, in this strange times that we're all living in. Uh, we'd also like to invite you to make a donation if you haven't done so yet. We've experienced a significant drop in income, of course, as many sites have. And if you're able to, that's very much appreciated. Um, a link to the donates in your confirmation email. But um, just want to thank you all so much for coming today and for your support. It's lovely to see 121 people plus the Dean were here, I think. Uh, I counted at one stage, so it's been great to join with you this afternoon. And so on behalf of the team at Southern, I'd just like to say goodbye and hope to see you in a fortnight's time. <laughs>